Wonderful. So hello, everyone, and welcome. We ask that you remain muted for the workshop until questions are requested. Uh, everyone was muted upon entry. So when you we do open it up for questions, please just remind uh, to unmute if you do have a question. Before we begin, I want to introduce the group that helped make this possible. This summer, we asked for leaders in the soccer community to come forward to develop strategies that will have a long-term impact in soccer. These individuals have stepped up to give their voice in designing and implementing of the Saskatchewan Soccer Diversity and Inclusion Strategy. And today I'm honored to introduce the 2020 Diversity and Inclusion Advisory Group. Odin Thompson, alumni CIS player and head coach. Carlos Carrera, player and head coach. Faith Jasper, player, coach, and part of the SSA Female Coach Mentorship Program. David Misko, SSA board member, soccer dad of five. Frank Laterza, provincial referee, and longtime player. Milton Ramirez, coach, referee, and referee assessor. Kashmir Bahia, player, volunteer, and coach for over 25 years. Lisa Balganiri, SSA board president and proud soccer mom. Robert Jarrett, player and head coach. Please check out our Friday member communication for more information about our amazing group members. So the group's mission, to provide and continue to develop an equal, fair, and welcoming environment for all to enjoy the game of soccer. Going forward, our group will work towards offering even more beneficial opportunities like the one we're witnessing today. I do know that I have a couple of our members that have joined us on the call. So as I've said in our previous meetings and us, um, having our discussions. Thank you so much for dedicating your time for such a great cause for soccer in Saskatchewan. And yeah, Christine and Greer, I gave you what, 15 minutes that was gonna take me and that was five. <laughs> so with that, I'll hand over the controls to Christine and Greer. Um, thank you ladies so much for coming in and giving us this presentation this afternoon. Awesome, thank you for having us. Uh, I'm going to um, share my screen from here and I will be playing, uh, just a heads up, I will be playing some videos as well. So um, just to get folks ready for that, um, okay. Go. all right so thank you all so much for again like i said thank you all so much for having us usually i say welcome but then typically it's we're being welcomed into the space so thanks for having us <laughs> um before we begin i'd like to just begin with a um territory acknowledgement um and then kind of provide a sort of more personal piece to um to this one here that i'll read out loud so um, I would like to acknowledge the sacred land on which I am located on to co-host this virtual space. Um, it has been a site of human activity for 15,000 years. Um, this land is a territory of the Huron-Wendat um, and the Putin First Nations. Oh, presentation slide is not showing. Okay, thank you. Um, let me just uh, try this again. There we go. <laughs> All right, so like I said, um, uh, I was reading uh, the sentence here, this land is a territory of the Huron-Wendat and the Putnam First Nations. 
the Seneca and the Mississauga of, of the Credit River, which is in Treaty 13. Um, the territory is a subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, um, which is an agreement between the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Confederacy of the Ojibwe um, and allied nations to peacefully share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. Uh, today, the meeting place of Toronto is still the home to many Indigenous uh, people from across Turtle Island, uh, which is North America, and we are uh, grateful to have the opportunity to work in this community um, on this territory. Um, uh, I'm not sure if folks are familiar with this uh, practice here, um, but typically I do add more of a personal piece to that, which is uh, I, I work in diversity and inclusion spaces. I work as a consultant um, and I entered into the space um, specifically doing um, LGBTQ inclusion work. Um, and in doing so, um, it is really important to me uh, to be acknowledging um, how I take up space in this work and also where I am uh, residing in. Um, and also the other pieces, um, understanding uh, the dish with one pun, uh, one one pun belt covenant, um, which is uh, the idea that um, in our area, um, folks came together and had uh, this one spoon. And uh, the idea was that uh, folks would then pass that spoon around in order to share resources. And so um, in this case, um, I am sharing information um, to hopefully um, build uh, the capacity of folks in this space um, to then um, connect better to the folks you work with and, and to each other um, and to better understand how we can all move forward together in a more interdependent um, and collaborative uh, approach. So that's um, one of the pieces and the last piece I'd share is that um, I have plenty of Indigenous folks in my life who I'm close to and have the honor to share space with and, and in fact um, you know they share very intimate stories with me and, and included in that is often their experience of colonial violence on a day-to-day -day basis and so I think um, as somebody who's doing a work in the diversity inclusion space here it's really important for me as, a, as an immigrant settler um, to then understand and how I am implicit in the system that uphold these types of um, everyday violence that happens um, to uh, folks around me. So those are just some things for folks to think about um, and perhaps to prompt folks to um, better understand um, what relationship you may have to folks around you um, and specifically indigenous people around you and to the land and the resources that you have um, ha access to. So that's a little bit about the territory acknowledgement. Um, I'm gonna move into uh, the Canadian women in sport portion, which I will throw, throw it over to Greer um, to introduce a little bit. Thank you, Christine. Um, my name is Greer, my pronouns are she and her, and I'm the marketing and communications coordinator for Canadian women in sport. Um, and in case you don't know who we are, we are, as it says here, dedicated to creating an equitable and inclusive sport and physical activity system in Canada. Uh, and we focus on systemic change. So we really wanna change the culture and the environment of sport um, to be more inclusive and to be more welcoming um, to women and girls specifically, but also to people um, across the gender spectrum and, and um, yeah, people who experience multiple different types of barriers to sport participation. Um, so we're really excited to be here today in partnership with uh, Saskatchewan Soccer. Thank you for inviting us. And uh, I also want to thank Christine um, for leading this workshop. Uh, and Christine is going to share uh, tons of great resources with you. And I also will have um, some other things to offer at the end in terms of resources that we have or other resources that uh, we think could be helpful in terms of um, also moving beyond this presentation and starting to implement some of these ideas uh, within your organization and like Christine mentioned, um, making your organization and your programming more inclusive to the folks that you serve. Um, so thank you, Christine, and, and I'll pop back in at the end. Um, but for now, I will just mention that this is our, our website, uh, womenandsport.ca, um, and there are lots of great resources there as well. And like I mentioned, I'll share some links uh, in the chat at the end of the presentation if you wanted to um, explore further. Thank you, Christine. Awesome, thank you, Greer. Um, so, of course, you folks may be wondering, who am I? <laughs> what do I bring into the space? Um, so uh, I will quickly introduce myself uh, in, in terms of the, the roles and the hats that I typically step into and wear. Um, 
In the sporting context, uh, I grew up playing sports. Multi-sport athlete was mostly mediocre, <laughs> just good enough to get by and to enjoy sports in in variety of different contexts. Um, I played. I ended up playing lacrosse uh, in in university. I picked it up, um, but before that, my main sport and also currently, or I'd say, are basketball. And uh, in the summertime, I play flag football, um, which you can see in the um, picture on the right hand side, um, which is a summer queer league that I um, I helped co-found and uh, continue to play in, of course, pre-COVID um, and hope to continue that uh, space um, in the future as well. Um, I use the pronouns she, her, hers, and they, them, and there. I use both sets, um, and I'll definitely go into that uh, piece a little bit later on in terms of what that means, um, both to me and to folks who are um, who are sharing pronouns and and uh, why that's important to do. Um, and the other piece of information I'll share is that uh, I am t uh, I I grew up wanting people to have more access to sports and not just access but also to be able to enjoy moving in the ways that feel good in their own bodies because you know having a body is, is quite hard um, on many days uh, and so um, I ended up going into physical and health education and went to teachers college and in uh, going through that process I realized how much work there is um, with inclusion within the sports and athletic context. Um, I also work as a personal trainer so I'm often thinking about uh, what healing centered practice looks like as a movement practitioner um, and working with a lot of folks with uh, different abilities and disabilities, as well as um, folks who manage chronic pain and um, retired athletes, especially uh, fall into that category oftentimes. Um, and so that's sort of a, a fairly wide scope of what I do in the sports and the athletic spaces. Um, but as I mentioned before, I work as a consultant and, and trainer, um, as well as an inst instructional designer in thinking about how learning can take place with um, people of all ages and specifically in and around um, diversity and inclusion spaces, anti-oppression, anti-racism. So that's uh, what I'll bring into the space here, and you'll be able to hear briefly um, about some of those aspects of my work. Um, and of course, I also want to um, engage at, and, and meet some of the folks in the space here. So if you'd like and are uh, able to, um, please feel free to share in the chat. Um, either three pieces of information or one of the three, uh, as you can see on the screen here. Um, so as you can see, cheers, fears, and unclear. So with cheers, um, anything you'd like to share in regards to sort of any successes you've had um, relevant to LGBTQI2S inclusion um, in your experiences com in communities. Um, and that could very much be being in this, uh, this webinar space to learn more, um, or perhaps somebody came out to you or, uh, or that you were able to come out if you are somebody from um, the, you know, uh, the queer community and uh, feel comfortable enough to be sharing that. Um, if you have any fears coming into this space, of course, any concerns you may have entering this conversation, um, any of that would be great to share as well so that as we're having um, more information shared, I can keep those pieces in mind in order to address that. Um, and then lastly, any unclear. So if you have any questions in general, uh, or perhaps you're wondering what are pronouns, um, please feel free to share that as well. So quickly take about two minutes time um, if you wanna just type in the chat or if, uh, if it would be easier for you to share verbally, um, you're also welcome to do so uh, by unmuting um, and speaking. Awesome, thank you, Eden. As I uh, see that um, a chair was shared about the members on the call taking the time to learn and engage in this important conversation. Anything else? I'll jump in, Doug Peterson, Executive Director of Saskatchewan Soccer. So thank you very much to our presenters today and for Eden and the committee for doing the work to get us here today. So just want to share that I think we're proud in Saskatchewan soccer that we're, we're trying to be a leader in this space. I think it's early days. We've got a long ways to go, but we're intentional about trying to make our organization more open and welcoming 
And so I thought I would just share that this morning. So thanks. Awesome, thank you. And it's super important, um, uh, the, the point around being very intentional about doing this work um, and being open is definitely um, key to success there. Uh, seeing another cheer shared, um, there has been a recent precedent of combining genders in youth sport, especially soccer and hockey, making, um, in bracket, in my opinion, uh, people of diverse genders to feel comfortable being involved in sport. Absolutely, that is definitely a one of the practices I'll be um, speaking to in terms of how to um, easily uh, take action towards a more creating a more inclusive space um, for folks to engage in sport and participate. An unclear was shared as a coach providing a sp safe space for young players to express themselves on and off the field. Absolutely, I will definitely speak to that as well um, briefly just to be thinking about um, what that may look like or sound like. Um, and then uh, another cheer was shared. Uh, we have great inclusive policies. Uh, there's a fear um, of uh, should we be doing more? And so I'll be speaking to that and hopefully um, with the uh, added information from today's webinar, you'll be able to have more conversations about um, you know, perhaps steering the conversation towards more learning um, and or uh, looking at policies to add more guidelines so that it is easier for folks to access and better understand perhaps step by step what to do um, as different circumstances pop up. So I welcome folks to continue to share um, any other questions or um, comments in the chat. I'll, I'll definitely be uh, keeping an eye on that. Um, throughout this webinar and then uh, speaking to that as much as I can so we can keep the conversation flowing. Um, and Unclear was shared uh, by Greer here in terms of supporting LGBTQI2S athletes in a virtual practice setting um, and how to take a trauma-informed approach to having conversations about inclusion with younger athletes. Now that is a definitely um, a great one to, I'd say, start the conversation with, um, with some of the pieces of information I'll be sharing, uh, but certainly um, a very important topic topic to be uh, thinking about. So some of the goals uh, for this webinar here today um, is uh, certainly to look at um, just deepening understanding of categories of identities, in particular to LGBTQI2S communities, but certainly the frameworks I'll share are applicable to anyone of really any experience um, and, and uh, would be a great way to kind of engage with um, perhaps your self-work and self-reflection around how you may self-identify um, and how you experience your, um, your sort of day-to-day -day interactions with others and with yourself. Um, exploring the basics of trans and non-binary identity and experiences. So I'll be sharing a video of folks sharing, um, or sorry, a portion of a video of um, trans and gender diverse folks sharing uh, what that means to them, as well as looking at within the sports context, how do these experiences uh, manifest, um, especially for LGBTQI2 as athletes. And then we'll look at um, the practice of allyship. Um, what are some key takeaways that you can walk away with and start thinking about or perhaps start actioning um, from here today. So hopefully no one is in the wrong room and this all feels good <laughs> moving forward to help with our um, engagement with this information. So um, there may not be as many spaces or opportunities for folks to share openly, but I hope that um, this would be a great tool for folks to carry this um, conversation forward. And this is a great guide, uh, list of guidelines. And of course, they're suggested um, to help with that. So um, going into the first uh, point there in terms of responsibility, we are all responsible for one another and ourselves. And so that's speaking to self-care um, and understanding that, especially in COVID, everyone is having a harder time <laughs> in general. And so it's important as you do more of this learning and this work, there may be really challenging times, um, whether it's uh, that you have lived experience and you're constantly being um and being subjected to uh, hard conversations and advocating for yourself, or it's that um, you're, you're advocating for somebody else, or perhaps you're coming into this conversation for the first time and it's um, challenging some of the ways in which you've come to understand of how to navigate uh, in, in this world. Um, all of those things are all very valid and really important to 
acknowledge that um, doing the work of diversity and inclusion is and can be hard and it is very personal. So it's important to take good care of ourselves and each other and with um, practice of compassion in that way. Um, curiosity is a good thing. Uh, which is that, you know, I definitely welcome questions um, as folks are thinking about or processing this, uh, these pieces of information. Um, but in asking questions and also beyond this conversation here um, is to think about why you're asking those questions and how you're asking those questions. Um, because a lot of times um, in asking those questions, sometimes we're demanding um, or, or asking people or requesting people to be sharing their own lived experience, which is um, can be hard at times and it can be empowering at times. And so it's important um, to think about the impacts of how we're engaging with this um, content, um, especially with folks who are uh, coming in with lived experience. Um, and this is also where I say that, you know, there's so many things to advocate for in this world. Um, the devil is not one of them. So if you like to play devil's advocate, um, hypothesizing situations that you personally would not experience, um, I definitely uh, ask you and invite you to refrain from doing so, um, as sometimes that may not be as productive for the conversation. Uh, confidentiality is the next piece in thinking about that with uh, twofold. So um, whatever I share here today, I hope that folks are able to take away with them, um, make meaning of that and share as widely as possible. But certainly if there are stories being shared throughout this conversation and moving on forward, um, that uh, anytime anyone's sharing their experience or their story um, and that you'd like to share with um, other folks with that, um, that you would check in with them around whether it's okay for you to share their experience or story um, so that that consent practice is there in keeping with uh, making sure that uh, the stories stay with the people, um, but the learning continues to spread. So um, that's uh, essentially it. Um, the last two points um, I wanted to share are mostly around your experience engaging with this topic, thinking about feelings that may come up. Um, and again, it goes back to the last point there around uh, being responsible for ourselves and our self-care practice. Um, and what I'd like to also now share is this next tool around um, engaging with this topic, whether it's about LGBTQI2S topics, so inclusion, um, or about diversity and inclusion at large, um, about thinking about other uh, systems of oppression or experiences um, that get brought into that conversation. So as you can see here, there are two models actually combined um, by uh, Karen B.K. Chan, who's also another facilitator in the sort of Toronto area who does a lot of sex education and consent uh, work. Um, the target in the middle there you see are um, referring to your learning experience, which is um, typically that we, we mostly operate in the comfort zone when we're coming across new information. Um, the stretch zone is typically where you land, where you're proceeding with caution. Um, sometimes you may end up in the panic zone where you feel emotionally activated. Um, and sometimes when that when, when you're in that zone, that's where we go into the uh, the second model here, as you can see the words around that target that speaks to your bodily um, physiological response to um, you know, the stimulations that are happening. And so you can see fight flight responses, freeze, and what I would add is fawn, um, which is a, a response where um, you may end up just agreeing, um, saying yes when you mean no. Um, and uh, that is uh, sort of a tactic that we've, uh, many folks have been taught to um, utilize in order to de escalate a situation. So that's a great tool to share. Um, I'd say this may be speaking to Greer's uh, uh, question about taking a trauma-informed approach um, in these types of conversations, as well as working with younger athletes or any athletes or anyone around you um, in sharing about what may come up in their bodies, body sensations, and also um, how folks can continue to stay engaged um, and, and to be able to participate, whether it's in conversation or participate in sport. Um, I just want to acknowledge that there were uh, some more pieces added in the chat, which is a uh, fear of um, dealing with the backlash of LGBTQ I2S in high performance sport due to the rules that specifically exclude that space for them. How do they feel safe being themselves if that is not allowed usually? 
Um, and so uh, we'll definitely talk a little bit about that in, in the sense of um, understanding uh, what are some barriers uh, that may be coming up, what are the sources barriers, sources of barriers, and how you folks can um, start thinking about um, challenging those barriers and perhaps advocating um, for changes in order to make those spaces a little bit safer. Another quote I'd like to add um, and share in the work of diversity and inclusion at large and really just kind of how I like to operate as a human being in the world is, uh, is Maya's uh, quote here saying, do the best you can until you met, know better. And then when you know better, do better. Um, you know, trying to acknowledge that uh, folks are coming in with good intentions, um, but that it's, it's uh, the learning of how you impact, um, how your actions impact others uh, that will allow you to know better and do better. Um, and that uh, I want to also recognize some folks are experts of, um, uh, you know, all of the people are experts of their own experiences, but certainly some folks in this space may be coming in with lived experience and can't speak to that very much so. Um, whereas there may be other folks who are sort of learning this um, for the first time and that's also absolutely okay because we're all here to do better um, from learning uh, more. So um, as a way to kind of get folks engaged uh, more uh, directly here, um, I wanted to start off with the sort of more obvious piece, which is the acronym, um, what the LGBTQ is this, uh, and I wanted to put this out there um, and ask uh, folks to quickly just kind of test your knowledge, what does LGBTQ stand for, and then I'll go into other versions of this acronym later, but if you'd like, just quickly type in um, what the, uh, the words, or sorry, the letters stand for in the chat. Um, and you can do it as a race if you like, but it's mostly uh, a race of how fast you can type. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Eden. So as you can see, it stands for lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, and queer. And certainly this is the shortest acronym uh, or one of the shorter acronyms that you'll see and come across, especially online if you're doing any research. Um, uh, and sometimes you'll see LGBT plus, LGBT asterisk. Let's see how folks do with this one here. And if there are any questions or uh, around words that are unfamiliar to you, I will definitely address those in, um, in a little bit. Let's see if you can take a stab at what these letters stand for. So we've, we've addressed LGBT. Let's see what, uh, in the Q, one of the Qs. Two spirit, yep. Questioning, intersex, asexual, uh, ally, and pansexual. So uh, one thing I'll say um, to that, that's a great stab at all of those uh, letters. Uh, one thing I'll say in terms of the word ally is that um, typically when the acronym is used, the word ally is not um, included in that A, and the the second A actually stands for agender um, and speaking to uh, the gender identity piece. And I'll explain more further around what that word might mean um, to some folks. Um, but uh, it's important to... Um, understand that you'll likely come across different types of acronyms and that's absolutely okay. Uh, it's not your job to, to know everything um, or, or to, to know what they all stand for, but it's important to understand the context of which that acronym is being shared and who's sharing them. Um, and just to be able to recognize that you're, uh, you will come across different types of acronyms. Um, but typically what you'll see and what is officially used here uh, with uh, Canadian Women in Sport is LGBTQI2S. Um, and I'll go into intersex uh, just a little in a little bit. Um, and, uh, and, and we'll go from there. Are there any questions in particular, uh, burning questions rather, around any of these types of words? for terminology or other. No, okay, so we will move forward into the next portion of this webinar here, which is around uh, the, the framework of which that I'll share um, to build up on our knowledge here. So um, 
the framework I'll be using is sort of the identity basics framework. Um, there's different versions of it. Um, here you see Gender Unicorn, which was um, created by a group of trans uh, youth. Um, and you can definitely find that at the TSER um, uh, website. And uh, it, it stands for Trans Student uh, Education Resource. Um, and that's a great um, resource here to, to use, utilize with youth um, and kids. Um, but it breaks the uh, understanding of gender and sexuality, all of that into four um, sort of different categories of looking at assigned sex at birth, which I'll go into a little bit, um, gender identity, uh, gender expression, and attraction. Um, to start with that uh, framework, and I'll share others as well that are similar, um, I'd like to start with the conversation around a sex assigned at birth um, with this video here um, about um, what to, what it's like being intersex because that's very much part of the conversation and to quickly sort of define why that is a, a category is um, and I say sex assigned at birth is that uh, typically when a, um, a child enters the world or a baby um, you'll notice that um, they were they, they're immediately labeled either male or female and um, more recently slowly um, with more advocacy work um, intersex is uh, also an option um, and that is typically based off of um, the uh, looking at the baby's uh, external genitals um, and not taking into account the internal gonads, um, the uh, existing reproductive system in the body, and also how that body will develop later on with different levels of hormones. Um, so I'm going to quickly share this um, video here um, to go into further of what why intersex is part of this conversation. Give me one moment. And all the videos I'll, I'll be sharing today are accessible on YouTube, so um, you could uh, you can expect a, an email with all of the resources later uh, on today. Raise your hands if you have testes. I'm Pigeon. I'm Alice. I'm Emily. I'm Cypher. And we, we are, are Intersexy. Intersexy. Intersex describes a person who doesn't fit the typical definition of male or female. I have XY chromosomes, but typical female genitalia. I'm a girl who has testes and XY chromosomes. I identify as a queer, gender non-conforming intersex person. I identify as a black intersex man. Intersex is not new. It's been around since the beginning of human existence. I mean, there's probably even intersex dinosaurs, if you think about it. Transgender has to deal with your gender identity, whereas intersex has to deal with your biological characteristics. Often, intersex people get surgeries that they don't want, and transgender people have to fight for surgeries that they do want. They gave my mom the excuse that the internal testes were cancerous, that I would develop cancer. They didn't even come up with an excuse, basically, in terms of a health-related reason. They instead just said it was about the appearance. A lot of doctors are very uncomfortable with the idea that I have testes, and they're still trying to get them removed. But I'm perfectly healthy, and there's nothing wrong with them. They did a surgery to remove my testes and told my parents to take me home and just raise me as a girl. And I didn't find out about it myself until I was 12. There aren't a lot of options or medical providers don't explore other options. My mom would put me in dresses and she would be like, oh, aren't you so cute and you're so pretty? And I would be like, no, this is horrible. Ah. I was um, put on hormonal treatment, which consisted of estrogen and progesterone. I just wanted to belong. I wanted to fit in. I didn't want to be different. So even though I knew something felt amiss, I conformed. He was very condescending. He was like, you intersex activists don't know what you're talking about. It's difficult for intersex people to find each other because from an early age we're told not to talk about our bodies. I did feel like I was the only one. My doctors always told me there was nobody else like me. And so it just perpetuates a vicious cycle of shame and stigma that we can't break out of. 
I would tell another intersex person that you are worthy. You are lovable. Your body is beautiful. You're beautiful. Intersex people don't need to be fixed. There's nothing wrong with them. I know you feel like you might not be able to get through this. I know you might have really dark thoughts, but I want you to know that meeting other intersex people and finding a community or a support group can be one of the most important aspects in your healing process. And we're out there, we're out here, we're here. And I just hope you can find us. Okay. Um, so feel free to um, share any thoughts that you may have um, upon watching this video. Um, there were definitely some great um, information shared around the experiences of folks who are intersex. Um, and this may be very much relevant to conversations that folks may be having in sport, especially for uh, folks who are engaged in track and field and thinking about Castro Semenya's um, experience and process right now. Um, in, in terms of um, access and eligibility of play in competition. So uh, so that's one video I wanted to share. Um, and in operating in, in, in a similar framework here, um, as you can see here, we have uh, an astronaut and also still breaking uh, the information down into four different categories. So we talked a little bit about sex assigned at birth um, and uh, uh, perhaps Perhaps folks can take a moment to think about what connections you can make to the assumptions we make about bodies um, and how those labels are put onto a body um, upon being born. And then um, as that body continues to uh, grow and develop uh, that um, you may realize that that person um, has agency to then talk about how they experience um, their uh, identities or their lived experience. Um, and so we'll go into uh, the second category here of understanding gender identity. Um, and this is where, uh, you know, what that talks about is essentially a, a person's most uh, innermost um, experience of um, gender and also something outside of it, which is that, um, that that is uh, an ideal that we work with, right? Um, so if you think about gender identity as sort of like a, a gender universe or uh, just a universe in general, you, um, there are countless stars and constellations. All of our experiences of gender um, differ just a little bit with some similarities. Um, and so if I were to talk about womanhood or manhood, um, there may be folks who resonate with those experiences um, but that they always differ just that little bit, um, if not a lot. Uh, and there are some dominant narratives that get shared um, in the world, um, but also there are other types of uh, experiences um, and other types of genders that exist. Um, and so it goes outside of just women and men, and there are also folks who identify um, as something outside of uh, women and manhood. Um, and this is where uh, also, like I said, because it's so different for so many people that um, you'll likely come across many, many different words that describe those experiences um, of which uh, may be described as trans, uh, non-binary, um, agender, as that has come up in, in the sense of not having a gender um, and or all of the above as well. So. That's gender identity, and uh, I'm going to use uh, a video here to help um, go into more detail, um, but uh, with more voices speaking to this um, concept. And this is a great video. I'll only share a portion of the video, um, but that I uh, definitely welcome folks to um, check it out. It's about eight minutes long in total, but I'll be sharing about four minutes of it uh, from here. Oh. Say it one more time. <laughs> None, but not re. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Three, two, one. <laughs> when we think of the word gender, a whole lot of images rush to mind. Most of us are taught the idea that people are born a boy or a girl. And we're expected to act a certain way based on what's between our legs. But that actually isn't true for everyone. It totally ignores the huge and amazing world of people who are trans and gender diverse. 
and that's what we're going to dive into in this series. Being trans, gender identity and what it's all about. Welcome to Trans 101. Traditionally, we tend to think of gender as decided by the body we're born in. People are usually assigned female or male at birth. But bodies and gender are actually pretty separate things. Gender is basically part of someone's internal sense of self. It can be male, female, neither, a mix of both, or exists totally outside of that. A person's relationship with their gender can also change over time as well. The gender we're assigned at birth usually gets reinforced by the people around us over our lives. Hearing things like, be a man or you're such a girl. You can feel like we're being told who we're supposed to be. Most people feel comfortable with the gender that they're assigned. But for some people, that label never quite fits and doesn't feel right. That's what's called being... Transgender! <laughs> You've probably heard the term transgender or even gender diverse. That's when your gender doesn't entirely match the one you are assigned at birth. A lot of people use trans for short. That can mean the gender you were assigned felt meaningless, restrictive or altogether just didn't quite fit. That might seem like a pretty broad definition and that's because it is. And the most important thing you need to know... There's no one right way to be trans. There are a lot of different ways people might identify. It's not about knowing every single one. But rather being open to difference when you encounter it. And also keep in mind that gender and sexuality are largely separate things. Lesbian, bisexual, asexual, gay and straight are a few different examples. But we're all those things in addition to being trans. They're not the reason we're trans. I think for me, there's kind of been this expectation that I transitioned because I like guys and wanted to get with them more easily. Actually, I'm a super gay lesbian. <laughs> when we talk about gender identity, people often think of two opposing groups. A binary of female and male. And that when you're trans, you go from one to the other. But there's a lot more to it than that. Putting it simply, non-binary is an umbrella term people use to describe gender that doesn't fit squarely into male or female. And this can include people who feel that their gender is a mix of both. Changes often. Or is something totally separate. Or have no strong sense of gender at all. Different people might use more specific terms to describe their gender, whilst others use non-binary. And trans people who aren't non-binary, who identify as strictly male or female, might describe themselves as binary. There's also a term for people who aren't trans, that's cisgender. Cisgender is a way of saying not trans. You might also have heard it's certain as cis. Being cisgender is when the gender you identify as totally matches the one you were assigned at birth. The term comes from Latin, meaning on the same side as. And is used in contrast with trans, which means on the other side of. It might be a new word to get used to, but it helps avoid a contrast of trans people and normal people. And instead, just recognise that being trans or cis are just different ways to be. So if you're cisgender, this is a great word to add to your vocabulary. As you can see, I stopped the uh, video about halfway through. They were about to go into transitioning and different types of transitioning that a person who's trans um, or non-binary may um, choose to access um, as a process to then become more uh, gender affirmed. Um, so a quick visual here to kind of um, summarize what they were talking about here in terms of understanding languages that um, trans or transgender is used as a, a broader umbrella term um, and that um, non-binary and binary may fall under it. Um, but when someone identifies as non-binary, um, they may not actually use the word trans um, to describe themselves. Um, but there may be trans people who say they're also non-binary. So that kind of uh, works in a, in a um, kind of funny way, but um, it all comes down to how that person come to access um, the information about those terms and how they feel and then sort of the relationship they have with those terms. Um, but what's important as what was mentioned in the video is that it is different for everybody um, and that um, all you have to do if uh, someone were to come out to you or share an experience with you is uh, for you to just um, 
uh, validate and, and simply, if you don't know what they're talking about, if, if you're unsure of the term that they just mentioned, you can always ask um, for clarification around, oh, you know, uh, you know, thank you for coming out or sharing that piece of information. Thank you for trusting me. Um, can you tell me more about what that means to you? And that's a great way to um, engage with uh, that sharing of uh, information that is deeply personal um, with that person while building that rapport and that trust around um, just wanting to better uh, get to know them in, in that uh, instance. So that's a little bit about gender and gender identity and the different uh, di the diversity within gender. Um, into the category, uh, the next category here, which is uh, they already mentioned attraction, um, and this is sort of the uh, the third category here in thinking about. Um, sort of all of the different identity categories here. And this is talking about the feelings that we have, <laughs> essentially, um, and the feelings that we have towards other people. Um, and it's talking about who we like and how we like them. Um, in the video, we talked. they talked a little bit about, uh, they mentioned lesbian, gay, uh, bisexual, asexual, straight, all of those words talk about um, or, or reference uh, who, we uh, we may be attracted to, um, but there's also some other terms that talk about how you experience those attraction um, feelings. So um, this is a great graphic here to kind of split that up into head, heart, and pants feelings. Um, and I'll quickly just kind of go through it. Uh, when you're experiencing head uh, attraction feelings or intellectual attraction um, to towards somebody, you may be thinking in that sort of platonic uh, context with a pal, um, and you're hoping to just connect better and more. Um, in a very platonic way. Um, when it comes to heart feelings, we're thinking about romantic or emotional attraction towards somebody. So you may end up wanting to go on a date with them um, and the, all of the cheesy songs that exist out there can um, start to really hold different meaning for you um, in, in the sense of you know having that crush type feeling um, towards somebody. When we're talking about pants feelings, um, that's referencing uh, or referring to the physical or sexual attraction feelings that somebody may have um, towards another person. Um, and there are plenty of words in that category there to describe that experience. Um, but mostly it's it's uh, it may involve having some pantsless activities <laughs> with somebody else um, uh, with consent, of course. Um, and uh, so that's uh, another sort of way to experience um, attraction. And of course, the term asexual um, talks about uh, felt in, within this category and talks about um, having a lack of physical attraction feelings towards somebody. And whether that's completely no feelings or um, some feelings um, or sort of a, a different order of which uh, of um, you may be experiencing different types of attraction feelings before this one pops up. Um, the last category is around uh, gender expression, um, which is, I, I've kind of left uh, the slide blank around that one because gender expression is sort of how um, the ways in which that we communicate our gender and the meaning um, of sort of what gender means to us. Um, Perhaps for some folks, it's not as conscious, and it is. It comes down to simply um, the different types of sports you play, the different clothes you wear, the tone of your voice, um, your mannerisms, um, all of those different uh, practices and, and experiences all encompasses sort of that expression of your gender. To put it into context uh, and share as an example, here's sort of how I use this framework to better understand myself, um, first and foremost, uh, but to also be able to share with folks who are close to me and that I want to continue to sustain a, a uh, intimate connection with. Um, so as you can see here, four categories, I've got some words put in there. Um, uh, keep in mind that I've had a lot of time <laughs> to be able to think through what works for me, um, as well as, uh, also come to understand better what these types of words um, mean at large as well. So starting from the left going to the right there, you see gender expression. Um, and I put in there tender mask because I mostly appear masculine, um, but am very tender. I have a lot of feelings. Um, I am often thinking about healing work, feelings work, all of those things kind of captures um, me being tender um, with other, other folks. Um, I'm sporty. 
I'm almost always uh, looking like a jock, <laughs> whether I like it or not. Um, and most people immediately make assumptions about me being sporty. Um, <clears throat> because of my body type as well. Um, I like to be stylish, but also comfortable. Um, and uh, the word that uh, most sort of encapsula encapsulates like or captures my um, experience is androgynous, which is sort of the combination of both masculine and feminine traits altogether. Um, and in short, if you see me on the dance floor, um, you would see, you know, Beyonce dance moves and Justin Timberlake dance moves all together. That's a bit of a fun time there. Um, with regards to gender identity, uh, as you can see, there are three words that, that I use to describe my experience. Um, Non-binary is one of them, gender fluid, um, in that I experience my gender in sort of more of a fluid way. So that may impact how I dress, um, the work that I do, how I interact with other folks, um, but that uh, my feelings of my gender shifts over time. And I also continue to identify as a woman as well, but that other uh, two other those two other words uh, uh, describes experiences that the term woman does not um, describe for me. When it comes to attraction, um, I use the term gay, lesbian and queer um, to talk about who I'm attracted to. Um, and demisexual speaks to how I'm attracted to people. So typically um, I need the, the head and heart feelings present in order for me to then um, not so much have more physical uh, attraction feelings, but more so to be able to enjoy that kind of interaction um, uh, with other folks. And then lastly, you see uh, within assigned sex, um, there's a couple words there. Dyadic mostly just means that I was easily identified as um, female at birth, um, based on sort of the uh, typical understanding of what uh, a female um, means in the world or being a female. Um, and uh, that it, it allows for folks who are intersex to not be called um, abnormal. Um, and the different acronyms there speak to, uh, or they break down to a female assigned at birth or assigned female at birth. So those are just some terms that describe my experience and um, allows me to feel more affirmed and validated within communities and also outside of. Um, but that's one way to use that framework. Um, I you know, invite folks to start thinking about how, what words you might use to self-identify within each, each of these categories and how other folks who may identify differently experience within the spaces that you move in and out of. And of course, feel free to share any um, questions or comments about this. Um, if this is the first time that you're sort of coming across this framework, um, this understanding or these terms, um, certainly it may be overwhelming. Um, and so I, I just want to validate that that is absolutely OK. And um, in seeing this sort of um, summary slide here of all of the terms that could be used in these different categories, um, certainly the one thing I want to note is that you do not need to know what all of these terms mean. Um, what's important is the experience of which you're um, having with a person who may be coming to you and sharing this these pieces of information and just recognizing what they're sharing with you is deeply personal and they perhaps may be looking for support. Um, so for coaches, administrators, um, anyone who has um, come out to you or has made an accommodation request and they're using any of these types of language to talk about their experience um, and, and you're unsure of how to move forward, um, you can always, uh, whether it's ensuring that they're not moving through this process alone and by saying, you know, I'm not sure um, how to move forward, um, but that let's work on this together can definitely help with the experience for that person who has just come out to you. Um, or you can say, you know, thank you so much for sharing this information. Um, I'm going to look into my resources and learn more about that and come back to you with some answers. Um, or that they already come to you with some ideas and options and you can work with them um, by um, validating those options as um, valid. Um, is it feasible? That's also a different question or, or a conversation to be had, um, but it's important to just say, let's work with this and let's see where we can go with that. Any questions so far? Okay, so one of the other pieces that a person may come to you with, um, and uh, this is also a, a point for um, acting in allyship, is the, the concept of 
pronouns. And I'll share a quick video about this as well um, to kind of allow you to better understand uh, what that means, why the people use it, why people share it, um, and why you, you may perhaps be considering um, or should consider to uh, share it as an act in allyship um, for folks from the queer and trans community. And this is done by the same group of folks as well, um, as you may have noticed that they had an accent <laughs> in the last video and they are from Australia, um, a group of teens called Minus 18. Um, they're a group of organization, um, mostly uh, they came together as a, as, as a group of youth um, and they created a lot of great resources that you can most definitely access, even including a pronoun app that you can practice using gender neutral pronouns. Um, but I'll play this video here. Oh my god, okay. Get that started. So I have to do it with that one. <laughs> what a pro. <prank. laughs> yeah. <laughs> Pronouns are basically words used to refer to a person rather than their name. They, she, and he are all examples of common pronouns. He and she are gendered pronouns. She's typically used by people who identify as female and he's typically used by people who identify as male. However, he or she pronouns are sometimes used by people who don't identify as strictly male or female. Some people prefer gender neutral pronouns. Gender neutral pronouns are generally used by people who identify as genderqueer or non-binary. A few common gender neutral pronouns are they, z, and a, but there are a whole array of gender neutral pronouns. People think long and hard about the pronouns I'd like to use and why. If you use the wrong pronoun for someone, that's what's called misgendering. When a person has new pronouns, it can take a bit of getting used to, but it's really important to use the right ones. A person's identity is very important and it's super important to respect that. So when people use the wrong pronoun to me, I find that I've gone through all this effort to kind of come out and be myself and it's kind of just thrown back in my face. Coming out for me was mainly awkward with a lot of people that used to know me, people didn't understand. I think there is a lot of misunderstanding. When people get my pronouns right, it makes me feel like I'm, you know, like being myself and people are responding to that and are just like respecting me as a person. When people get my pronouns right, I feel respected by them and I end up feeling a lot more comfortable around them. Sometimes if you identify someone uh, with a different pronoun that they don't identify as, you can potentially actually upset them and I don't think you should be upsetting someone in this process and uh, that's why I think it's very important to know what someone identified themselves as and respect it. It's not about like you're a terrible person if you mess up or you're a terrible person if you take time to adjust. You're totally not. But it's more about making that extra effort for someone that you do care about or just kind of being a bit considerate that everyone has different needs and you know it's just a really cool thing to do for a person. And I think it's easy to not quite get that or just see it as you know there's a person who's mad at you and outwardly they might be a little bit upset but inwardly what they're feeling that's motivating that reaction is so much more and understanding that they're not hating on you, it's just that they really are probably a bit fed up and a bit hurt. It's not always easy to come out and tell people that you're trans. Never assume someone's pronouns, just ask if you're not sure. Using the correct pronouns is a pretty big deal and it's a really awesome thing to do. Genitals don't equal gender. This is probably the biggest mistake people make. It's a pretty easy assumption to make, but genitals and body don't actually reflect anything about a person's gender at all. Above all else, don't try and argue with this person, whether you personally agree or not. A person who's asking you to use those pronouns likely has put a lot of thought into it and trusts you. Basically, what's more important? Someone's anatomy or who they really are and their happiness? Sometimes, however, you will slip up and use the wrong pronouns. It's not good, but it does happen. Getting used to someone's new pronoun can take time. And you may feel pretty awkward or even guilty when you make a mistake. Some may sound pretty strange at first, and changing the words you use in general can be harder than expected. If you do slip up accidentally, it's important to not lash out at the person or blame them. You might not pick it up instantly, and it's important to try hard on this. But if you do slip up, don't snap on it. Just keep trying your best and you'll get the hang of it with time. Don't freak out, just make a quick apology, correct yourself and keep going with the conversation.
making a big deal out of it, it's probably gonna make them feel bad and make the situation very uncomfortable for both of you. If you hear someone deliberately or even accidentally using the wrong pronouns for a person, don't hesitate to pull them up on it and politely correct them. Hopefully that helps to explain pronouns a little bit better and lets you know how much it can mean to a person. And it's super important to get them right as much as possible. Something as small as a tiny word like that could have a huge impact on a gender diverse person. What, how they feel at the moment and how they feel in the long term. Having uh, good, accepting, awesome and loving people around you can really be life changing. Okay, so they made uh, a reference to a variety of different types of gender neutral pronouns. Um, and this is a great uh, visual slide to um, capture that. Um, as you can see from the left, you see they, them, and their. Um, this is likely the most common one um, that folks are familiar with. Um, and then moving across from the left to the right, you'll see other types as well. Again, to note, um, you don't have to know all of these gender neutral pronouns. Um, they may even feel like a, a new, dif uh, new different language uh, to you, um, and that's absolutely okay. Um, it's uh, really important um, only when um, perhaps someone is sharing uh, the, any of these types of pronouns uh, sets with you that um, you practice um, using them. Uh, when they're in the space, especially when they're in the space, but certainly, um, or, or sort of within that context of the conversation, um, but certainly uh, away from that context as well, because we all know that practice, um, some may say practice makes perfect, but from my kinesiology professor, um, he said, uh, practice makes permanence. And so um, the more you practice, the more you'll get better at it um, and that they'll seem less like a, a different language to you. Um, and of course, um, for any French speaking folks, there are also French um, pronouns, um, but with uh, with any types of language that are coming from sort of that um, romantic um, type of languages of like French, uh, Italian, Spanish that are very much gendered in that uh, discourse. Um, it's definitely a little bit more complicated, but that there are definitely folks within different communities um, utilizing different types of gender neutral pronouns um, within those languages. So it's important to just acknowledge that that exists and uh, for anyone who shares it with you um, to then practice and utilize in um, as, as much as you can. To really put this into context before we move into um, more so what does that look like in the sporting space? What are some of the experiences um, looking, sounding and feeling like? Um, I wanted to put out these questions for you, whether you'd like to engage in it in the chat box or if you want to just write those down and um, continue this conversation with, uh, with each other after the webinar and throughout. Um, certainly, uh, please feel free to take a snapshot or a screenshot of this um, and uh, share a little bit. There was already a question earlier, I believe, um, that talks about how do we make spaces safer on and off the field, um, especially with younger athletes. Uh, that is definitely um, speaking to the second question there around um, within the sporting context, how can we remove some of the barriers? Um, and I'll quickly speak to that now, and then that'll segue us into the next portion. Um, but certainly uh, bringing in examples, visibility um, always helps. Um, referencing uh, famous athletes who are queer um, and trans um, and excelling, or not at all, really just that, that general uh, representation, um, bringing that into the context can really help um, you know, children and youth um, to have somebody to look up to and, and to be able to learn more about because a lot of these athletes um, are also active in um, doing some of this act, uh, advocacy and education work as well. Um, especially a lot of trans women athletes who are in high performance of uh, sports. Um, so uh, that's definitely something to uh, look more into, learn more about um, so that there's representation. Um, I'm seen in the chat here uh, by Eden uh, talking about remove barriers, reviewing facility accessibility for sure. 
looking at change rooms, bathrooms, and um, to make that uh, available for all. Um, that is definitely something that folks can do um, before a tournament uh, takes place. So looking into that facility to look at um, what are the options? Are they all gendered? Um, are there opportunities to make uh, a space gender neutral or finding a third space that is accessible? Um, because you know, when, when it comes to sports uh, competitions, uh, it's not just the athletes also, but also the, the folks um, that they bring with, with them uh, into the audience to watch. Um, and there may be other folks of different abilities as well in thinking about uh, physical accessibility also. Um, but alongside that, of course, having change rooms and, and bathrooms available for athletes to access is uh, uh, an, of um, utmost priority. Um, and uh, if you're working with uh, within really old facilities, it's all about working with the team uh, facilities team there to think about um, how you can make accommodations. Um, and there's different examples as well um, across the board on the internet and within different uh, provincial and national sport organizations that have started doing this work. Um, so I highly encourage folks to look into it. I'll be sharing some uh, resources later on um, for folks to have access to um, and, and uh, have folks to speak to as well if they have specific questions. So um, I'm going to move into the experiences of Canadian sport um, or sort of sport in institutions at large. Um, and one of the key things to, to note that is relevant to um, experiences of LGBTQI2S athletes um, most often is um, this idea of misogyny and how that comes through in the experience of sport. Um, misogyny, a quick definition of that is, is sort of the devaluation of femininity um, or um, a being of feminine um, regardless of gender of the person. Um, and it does hurt everyone. Um, so I'll kind of break that down into what that looks like. These are definitely um, larger words um, and not so good words either, um, but certainly um, highly recommend for folks to write those down if you're unfamiliar with them. But starting off with heteronormativity, so the norm of um, being straight or the assumptions that get made about people, um, about them being straight, as opposed to just sort of assuming that everyone is straight. Um, sizeism, um, experiences around size and the assumptions that gets made about folks who are um, thin, uh, thin bodied or larger bodied. All of that, all of that as alongside misogyny. All of these definitely impact everybody. And as I go through the bolded words um, down the list, you'll notice that uh, these are all mostly add-ons to how LGBTQI2S people are, ex are experiencing um, sport um, in general. But um, both cisgender and transgender men and women are limited to um, access in uh, specific sports that are deemed as non-conforming to their genders um, because of traditionally gendered ideals. So when we're um, thinking about the examples of that, there may be low enrollment in ice skating and gymnastics for boys because it's deemed as feminine um, and in hockey and football for girls because it's deemed as more sort of masculine um, and uh, they get made fun and, and folks get made fun of um, within sort of the athletics context if they perhaps are not as good <laughs> at a certain sport or um, of you know having control over their body. Um, so. Uh, I certainly, when I walk through a, a sporting space, the people immediately assume um, that I actually, and interestingly enough, they assume that I play soccer. Um, I'm not bad at it, but I certainly uh, wouldn't center that as my main sport. <laughs> um, but they just take a look at the size of my thighs and my calves, and they assume that I play soccer and um, would be good at it. <laughs> um, so those are sort of like examples of how how that uh, can impact everybody, regardless of gender or sexual orientation. Um, to add that on specifically for queer people who, um, so this is a referencing folks who are um, uh, gay, bi, queer, um, thinking about sexual orientation or attraction here, um, that they that we experience even more so on top of what's already been mentioned, um, uh, you know, unsafe spaces because of assumptions about gay and bi people. Um, so an example, uh, a couple examples is that um, 
experiencing physical violence for a lot of boys who are perceived as gay. So even straight boys um, who are a little bit more feminine, perhaps in, in sort of having flamboyancy in their um, the way of speech, mannerisms, um, thinking about gender expression now, right? Um, to, in, in, in experiencing their time in perhaps a locker room or in school, um, and then for uh, for girls, perhaps there may be sort of more emotional side of uh, experience uh, violence there um, about rumors of, of somebody being a lesbian because perhaps they have short hair um, or play a really deemed, you know, deemed masculine sport. So those are examples of how misogyny comes into play here. All of that continues to devalue um, femininity for boys and also um, for um, folks who are uh, perhaps assigned female at birth, identifies as women, but are appearing more masculine that they then um, are tied to uh, these assumptions. And then perhaps that there is a little bit more acceptance for um, queer women because of that idea that within sport, you know, masculinity is more highly valued. To continue that, um, in thinking about now trans uh, and non-binary folks, the um, the words mentioned there are all um, specific uh, words that describe the experience um, on a systemic level. Um, so again, I encourage you to write those down, look those up if you're unfamiliar with those words, um, but that transphobia and cis sexism, so um, valuing or making the assumption that uh, people are all cisgender, um, and that could even include saying to trans people, oh, you don't look trans. Um, all of that can very much uh, impact um, trans and non-binary people's experiences in sport, in thinking about um, a lot of the access, actual access to sports or even sports uh, facilities. Um, so that could be policies with gender categories for competition only. Um, that could be, uh, you know, a lot of transphobic words being said, assumptions being made, um, the unwillingness to use proper pronouns for somebody who has transitioned or are transitioning. Um, and then lastly, you know, that required modification of bodies in order to play. So that specifically targets trans women. And as you can see, any women who may fall outside of um, what is traditionally um, uh, sort of regarded as, uh, you know, being a woman. So Castor Semenya is an example of somebody who identifies as a woman, um, but was forced out, uh, didn't even know that she was intersex until she was subjected to forced testing um, that was very personal and intrusive. Um, and uh, so, so that's an example, a very extreme example of somebody trying to access sport and competition and not being able to um, for all of these reasons and more. Um, so those are some examples, unfortunately, um, but there are many more and most uh, trans and non-binary people just don't access sports in, at large. Um, and that, that may be um, a reason why that perhaps if folks may have not come across trans and non-binary people um, because it's unsafe to even step into the world of sports or to even consider playing any sports at all. And to really um, drive the last point into this uh, conversation here is the idea of intersectionality, which is a term coined by Kimberly Crenshaw, um, coming from a legal context of thinking about experiences for black women, experiencing both racism and sexism, uh, in the workforce, um, but this is applicable and widely used now in the, the conversation of diversity and inclusion um, in around the experiences of navigation in the world that cannot solely be reduced to one aspect of a person's identity. So um, for a lot of queer and trans people, um, because of lack of access, access to safer spaces in sports and in physical activity, um, many are also larger bodied, they're fat or, um, you know, of a different disability or ability. Um, they're racial, they could be racialized. Uh, they could be unhoused, unemployed. So now thinking about socially determined, um, uh, yeah, socially, uh, social determin de determination of health um, and uh, thinking about, you know, 
of course, people will not be accessing sports if they don't have a house, <laughs> if they're homeless, um, if they're unable to access safer employment. Um, all of those things can definitely impact um, how much a person would have the capacity to access sports. Um, and then specifically now thinking into sort of newcomers, um, families that have children that would like to participate in sport but may experience a whole variety of different um, experiences of violence um, in, in contexts that may be um, not as representative for um, their identities and experiences. So. Um, barriers experience altogether for people who are marginalized um, at the intersections of all of these different types of identities can impact, um, you know, how much or how little they can access to, uh, sports at large. Um, so that's sort of at large uh, an overall scope of some of the experiences. Um, but in thinking about coaches, um, administrators um, who, who may be queer or trans and or trans, um, there's not a lot of out coaches who are out because now you're thinking about unsafe um, and precarious employment um, and the assumptions that may come um, with uh, different families and parents who are accessing the uh, sports league um, for their kids or for themselves. Um, and and how um, coaches are regarded and the stigma that goes around, um, you know, queer coaches that may continue to exist within that space. Um, and so this is really important because now employment issues are at play. Um, and this includes volunteer coaches as well in the sense of agency for them, um, whether or not they would want to volunteer uh, their free time to be coaching a sport comes down to I mean, for the lack of a better word, how stubborn they are in staying connected to the sport and whether um, they're able to tolerate experiences of homophobia, biphobia, um, transphobia, and all of those above. So what can you do? Last portion um, for uh, this webinar here today. What can you do moving forward in thinking about allyship? So what is effective? Um, I've broken it down to a couple of points here. Um, so the first one is really understanding what you may not have encountered um, and uh, thinking about what more you need to learn going into that second point there. Um, because uh, at the end of the day, the more you're exposed, the more uh, you're able to kind of um, unlearn and relearn um, some of the, the ways in which you've been taught to um, operate uh, on your own, as well as with others, and especially working with youth. Um, they may be coming to you with new terms and concepts um, and ideas, um, and it's important to then just kind of have access and connect with that in order to make the space safer um, for for them. Um, another thing is amplifying voices. Um, so especially working with youth and children, um, you may have children coming to you and saying, hey, you know, I don't feel this particular way about my gender or um, I want to use a different name and different pronoun. Um, and that you may be the one trusted adult in their life. Their parents may not even know about it. That could be a very highly uh, likely um, scenario. Um, and that's also where you may need to think about how you can amplify and advocate for um, this child or this youth um, in order for them to continue to be able to access a safer space with you um, and within the relationship you have with them. Um, and then that uh, definitely ties to the idea of confidentiality and how safe it is um, you are if um, or not at all, if you were to out them to their parents. Um, and of course, realize that you're going to make mistakes. Um, and I'll share um, I'll, I'll share a quick tool in around sort of accountability and what that looks like um, in acknowledging that something happened and someone says, you know, you did something that hurt me. Acknowledging that you did uh, that it happened, um, saying sorry, and then making that story come to life. So um, asking them if they need any support, centering their need in the moment um, and uh, moving forward, um, looking at what action you can take in order to avoid that instance. So um, for the example of pronouns, um, you've heard in the video already, but certainly you may uh, slip up um, working with somebody who may have transitioned um, from the time that you met them to the time that, that you're engaging with them now. Um, and you may be used to using one set of pronouns, but now you have to switch over. That's going to be a um, 
uh, cer certainly going to be a little bit harder. Um, and so practice is going to be needed and uh, mistakes may already may happen. Right. So it's important to be hold yourself, um, be holding yourself accountable for that. Another piece, which is, oh, I'd say, one of the largest pieces to focus on with allyship is that it's an ongoing practice. Um, you know, I think of that as like a, a key card that I swipe every moment, any moment in time. Um, in terms of my interactions with anybody um, at large and also with myself and thinking about um, how can I do better always, um, as opposed to self-identifying openly and saying I am an ally. Um, actions certainly speak louder than words. And so um, as simple as uh, something as simple as putting your pronouns in the Zoom um, name um, or your email um, or your business cards uh, and sharing pronouns in meeting spaces and making that a, an overall general practice as opposed to only going to the person who looks gender diverse and saying, what pronouns do you use? Um, and but just going ahead to just share your own can signify and communicate that you're familiar with this conversation and make you a potentially safer person for someone to go to for support if they need. And this is a picture of um, a video about uh, allyship, actually, and Francesca, um, who is a cis woman um, and ends up actually making a mistake of saying trans um, transgender in in the video um and she was also apologizing um to her fans i believe um this is from a couple years ago but talking about what effective allyship can look like so highly recommend this human um to just to check out as a resource i've already mentioned this but certainly using gender neutral language looking at your policies making sure that um it does not assume um, he or she uh, gendered pronouns, but that you just um, take an overall scan of all of your policies and change that into they, them, and their. Um, that can definitely save you um, a lot of time and potential harm done to folks who are trans and or non-binary. Um, <laughs> something to avoid to do, which I think we're all hardwired to do, unfortunately, at large, is assuming somebody's gender. Even I do so myself as a non-binary person, and I have to stop that consciously myself, um, is, is, you know, you can't assume somebody's gender by looking at them. Um, it's It's got to come from them sharing it with you if they choose to. Um, and there are gender neutral terms that can be used, honorifics, Mr. and Mrs., there's mix um, that you could use, or just kind of avoiding that, uh, that function in general on forms, registration forms, systems that would be helpful, um, but that when you're addressing groups of people, there are plenty of gender neutral terms you could use. Um, I'd say get creative, it's fun, um, but if you do end up going into your habit of Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. You can always add the last portion, which is sometimes what I do if I uh, end up falling into that, which is um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and all of the awesomeness in between and outside of. Um, at least you're addressing all of the different uh, diversity within that uh, sort of spectrum. So those are great uh, to start looking into and uh, doing that practice of. Um, and uh, there are plenty of resources that you can look into in terms of gender neutral language uh, used. You can just simply Google it. Plenty of those um, will pop up right away. I've already mentioned I uh, use correct pronouns. Um, one note, thing to note is uh, it's not preferred pronouns, but correct pronouns. Um, it's not a preference. It is just their pronouns, just like any of our names um, and any nicknames we choose to use. Uh, it's important to um, honor that as much as you can. This is a, another tool um, that's quite similar to what I had shared about accountability. Um, if you get called out, uh, which is in the moment you someone raised that awareness to you of saying, hey, you did something, or called in, which means um, they're now explaining to you why that called out, uh, call out was done, um, or why that uh, whatever you did was harmful to them. This is a great tool by Lukeo, um, and it's uh, Googleable as well. Um, if you type in Lukeo, I'll just put it into the chat quickly. 
Um, and if you type in claim, you should be able to find this graphic, print it out if you like. Um, but I think it's a very useful tool in general, um, especially when someone says you've done something and you know something has gone wrong. Um, first one, it says center yourself. It does not mean make it about you. It means um, do what you need to do in order to come back to the conversation so you're um, not allowing your feelings to take over um, that conversation there and that that person feels heard. Um, which is the next point, listen to what that person has to share with you. They're taking their time to tell you, they trust you um, to do something about the information they shared with you. Um, acknowledge, apologize, which is what I've mentioned. Um, but again, you have to make those words come to life. Um, inquires in brackets, which is uh, the fact that, um, like I said, a person may not have the energy to share more information with you um, or they just don't want to talk about more of their experiences of violence with you and so that is something to be checking in on if um, you're ever in that position of wanting more information um, so you can definitely go away check in with somebody else that knows them um, perhaps that person can help advocate or provide some information to help you uh, learn better uh, learn to do better rather Moving forward, which uh, kind of leads you to the next step here, um, is that continual learning, um, refraining, you know, avoiding those mistakes again, um, and, uh, you know, going back into that idea of allyship being an ongoing practice. Um, one key thing is perhaps learning more uh, about the uh, lived experiences within your sport of your athletes um, and uh, or of uh, the sport in general. There are plenty of uh, folks who are speaking out, um, you know, retired Olympians, current athletes. Um, there's some soccer folks as well who have come out um, in different leagues, I believe in the European League. Um, and in Brazil as well, I may be wrong, um, but that they have come out and uh, started to really address the uh, different words that are used, um, slurs um, and within the audience crowd as well. So take some time, learn more about it. Um, people are making videos, um, especially if you're unfamiliar with trans uh, communities and experiences there, look, uh, look, look, look those up as well as opposed to asking somebody directly in front of you to share very personal experiences with you. Taking action is another step. Um, so, you know, if you're hearing younger folks or anybody in your space using slurs, uh, homophobic words like that's okay, um, take that moment in time to just uh, stop it. Um, and something that I like to do as a sort of, you know, putting on the teacher hat, uh, coaching hat here with younger folks, especially, is I typically just ask more questions like, what do you mean that's so gay? Or what's so gay about the situation? <laughs> what involves, you know, two people having, uh, you know, attraction feelings towards another, one another? Um, so kind of unpacking that could be a helpful way to intervene um, while teaching, making it a, you know, sort of a learning or teaching moment for um, younger athletes. Um, so taking that time, learning more about how you can intervene could be a great way to um, continue this practice of allyship. What resources that can help you are these, of course, um, there's the cause position statement on trans inclusion in sport. There's ongoing work around that. Um, there's the uh, document that is very informative around um, specifically around like, you know, the uh, impacts of testosterone on uh, um, performance in sports um, or really lack thereof. Uh, but Certainly uh, more information, um, some terminology, glossary, uh, definitions, all of that is in there um, in this document and it's freely available. And as Greer has shared in the uh, chat there, some, some links there, um, it's uh, definitely online um, and accessible. It's a longer read, but a very informative one. Via Sport has one as well on LGBTQI2S. Uh, it's a toolkit, um, some quick uh, takeaways. There's one for coaches that I was able to be a part of as well um, in sort of framing how you can um, go through sort of a step-by-step -step checklist, um, some, some, some thinking to, that you can do immediately around um, how you can sort of shift or expand your coaching practices um, to make it more inclusive. Um, so those are three key resources. There are other organizations that are also doing this work. You can play is specific to um, uh, professional hockey uh, 
in that there's plenty of media, media campaigns made, um, and you can also make a pledge through that organization. Um, there's uh, just a picking a, a couple here. Um, one team um, program by the Canadian Olympic Committee. They've got a couple folks um, or a, a full team of folks <laughs> ready to speak about their experiences, whether it's uh, being an um, acting in allyship as a as a team player, um, team member, or um, folks who are queer and sharing um, their experiences within higher performance sport. Um, so these are some experiences. There's also a sports inclusion task force that I'm part of, um, alongside um, a couple other folks um, who are very much involved in, in pushing, uh, you know, the advocacy work for trans non-binary folks, as well as um, sort of the LGBTQI2S um, spectrum at large. Um, so we're working through that actively. If this is something you're passionate about, that is something to look more into. So a couple things that you can definitely check out. Um, there's also uh, a new, um, so this is a, re a res resource that I shared, Inclusion in Sport. Um, the Canadian Centre for Ethics in Sport also has another document um, on looking at uh, sport policy. Um, so if uh, you're an organization, you're looking at updating your policy or creating one on specific to gender equity and gender inclusion, um, there is a template that you can take a look at um, to uh, see what you can put into uh, action. Um, and uh, one thing to note is that there are definitely um, language being updated at all times. So definitely, if uh, if you'd like, you can reach out to me, reach out to Canadian Women in Sport to be able to have um, some support there in going through that work. Oh, apologies. I'm just going to keep going here to wrap up. Um, responsible coaching movement, building this practice into uh, that uh, that learning as a, as a responsible coach is definitely important. Thinking about safer, um, safe sport, um, adding this topic in there would be really key too, because you're thinking about safety. Invisibility, like I said, pronouns would be a great way to start, um, but you can use these types of uh, um, stickers or pledges that uh, allow you to be more visible about this work that you're doing. So that takes us to the end of this uh, webinar. Thank you all so much for staying on. I'll throw it over to Greer to um, share uh, the link. Uh, thanks, Christine. I'm just pulling that up now. Um, and I did just want to mention, I shared links to a couple of resources that um, Christine mentioned in the chat. Um, and I also want to draw attention to the last one, which is a resource um, from an organization called Wisdom to Action um, that they developed <clears throat> excuse me, and it's an implementation-based guide to 2S LGBTQ um, inclusion. Uh, so essentially what that means is, is kind of navigating through an LGBTQ inclusion project with the similar um, pathway that we would use to implement other types of programming, like a new tech program or a new um, uh, CRM or a system like that, um, kind of walking you through the steps to go uh, beyond the initial learning phase into an implementation phase. So I thought that was something uh, that could be helpful to share as well. Um, so yeah, I, I wanted to thank everyone for participating today. I know it's a lot of information and um, thank you, Christine. I always appreciate your approach to these types of complicated conversations. Um, so happy to be listening in. And um, like I mentioned, I will just pull up the evaluation link and, and I'll maybe leave some space if there's questions because we have a few extra, extra minutes here. So I'll be back with the link in just a second. Hey Greer, um, before you wrap up, I just wanted to say on behalf of Saskatchewan Soccer, I wanted to thank Christine Greer from Canadian Women in Sport for such an educational presentation. And I hope everyone that was on the call stays, stays safe during these times and has a great remaining week. So thanks so much. Thanks everyone. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Uh, I'll stay on for another uh, two minutes or so.
Uh, sorry for the delay there. I've just put the link to the evaluation in the chat. So if you're still around and you do have time to take a couple minutes to fill that out, we would appreciate it. And um, thank you again, everyone. Okay, uh, I'll also um, I'll send you a list of the participants too if, if we need to send a link out to any individuals that stepped out. But it looks like a lot of people are starting to exit at this time. Are both of you comfortable with me ending? Perfect. Thanks again and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank, Thank you. you. See you. Have a good one. Bye.